having a pathogen in that milk that's intended for pasteurization, not intended for human consumption. <laughs> Yeah, well, they're not supposed to be a cable. They're supposed to have pasture access in four months a year. They're supposed to have 3% of the dry matter coming from pasture. And I think for the most part, that's probably happened. But 23%. Uh, uh, 30% for these four months of the year. But 30% dry matter is a lot when you consider that pastures are 80% water. So you've got to eat a lot of pasture to make sure there's enough dry matter in that pasture. Bottom line is, there are different locations around the United States and Canada where you produce raw milk. In Maine, they got two feet of snow and freezing to death for four months a year, right? And back east. So you have you wouldn't put them on pasture right now. You gotta keep them inside of a barn and manage them very carefully because if, if uh, they got outside, their kids would literally freeze. So in Arizona, you don't have that. In California, you don't have that. And you have a lot of heat in the summer. So the, the different conditions around the United States, you have to think about how they're gonna produce raw milk optimally there. It'll be different than our plan. So everybody's got their own thing going on. You won't see huge dairies in, in the northern climates unless there's a big capo inside deal because they'll freeze to death in the wintertime. Uh, you'll see generally smaller dairies. The average dairy in Wisconsin is 50 to 70 cows. The average dairy in California is 1,200 cows. Wow. So, yeah, 1,200. <clears throat> 1, we're, we're about to be 400, right, on 500 acres. So you really have to think about conditions when you think about milk because it has everything to do with what that milk's gonna reflect. If you put that cow in a certain kind of conditions, the milk's gonna reflect those conditions. Just like we, living on Earth, the conditions we live in actually manifest, they have a lot to do with the health that we manifest ourselves. So conditions matter. The tests we do validate and verify the conditions that the cow will put in. So pretty exciting stuff, yes? CAFO. CAFO, C-A-F-O. Confinement, or confinement, confinement animal feeding operation. Either way. You know, isn't it, uh, isn't it that if they, if a cow is primarily eating grass with some other stuff in it, their, their acidity level in their gut is such that it does not allow um, E. coli and salmonella to thrive. But if they're eating a lot of grains, their acidity levels within there, isn't that? That is mostly true. It's mostly true. However, anytime we make a blatant comment, it's actually found not to be true. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful. It's based on conditions. The relative risk it's drops, but it's right. not to zero. Right. When you've got deer in the mountains and they do fecal swabs on them at the ranger station when you check the deer tags, guess what? 3% of those deer have E. coli 015787 and all of those are grass fed. Wow. So this bad bug is out there and you have to be thinking about that. So grass feeding is not a pure 100% but it drops it dramatically risk, from where it would be right. on a silage-based, grain-based, which has a much higher incidence. So it's a relative risk issue, not to zero, but bouncing around at low levels. And that's one of the things we've had in the past is people saying passionately and decisively blanket black and white statements, which actually become not really completely true, but they're partially true. So you have to really think of things in terms of how nature works and how things are not really uh, in concrete, there's variability and conditions matter. At really a very interesting thing in organic pastures is we test our manure every year mm -hmm. in the most stressful time of the year, which is in the summer heat. Right. And in the last four years, we have never had an E. coli 0157H7 found in 400 cows fecal samples. We found it five years ago in some of our heifers, and all the young calves have salmonella in their feces. It's very interesting to see where different ages of the cows that feed and the conditions have everything to do with what you find in the feces. So it, that's why we put our calves in a special area because we know they sloth pathogens like crazy when they're first newborn with the immature immune systems and different digestive tracts. But the cows, where they're at with the mature immune system and their digestive um, maturity and the feeds they're given, they rarely have E. coli. That's just the first test to make sure the conditions we have is that if a little fleck of, 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 bac of bacteria from a fecal sample got into our milk somehow, it wouldn't have E. coli in it. Right. So it's kind of interesting to see the, the, the different hurdles we put across this race from grass to glass to make sure, because we don't have that big high jump that they've got for pasteurization, which is do anything you want, it's all going to get cooked, right? And let me tell you what, it's ugly what they get in that tank. If you've got 50 dairies out there and 49 of them do just a great job, 
Most times it's the one that does a great job with the 49 dump. But the bottom line is it doesn't matter what they do because it all gets commingled together. You got one stellar guy and 50, 43 guys that are terrible. They all get dumped in the same tank. Who cares? They get paid the same. So there's, there's a really an interesting thing with, with pasteurization is it's a very high hurdle, very high, high jump that crap goes into, gets cooked to death, and then you get the, the stuff. Versus raw milk where you got all these little things you put in the way, working with and measuring Mother Nature that the right conditions and the right testing to, to validate that in fact the end product is safe. Now when I say safe, that's a relative term too. Because a farmer, let's just pick on the Amish today. An Amish man running around his farm, he can eat anything on that farm, he won't get sick. I won't say that. Categorically. In general. But generally this speaking, man. that's generally true. They've got they've got immunity to Campylobacter, they've got E. coli, they're 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 titers, their their uh, immunoglobulin status, their immunity status is just so different because they're hanging out with the chickens, the pigs, everything. But you go down to downtown LA. Where a kid was born in Skyscraperville. <laughs> never got in the dirt. And they were in the dirt, right? And if they do play in the dirt, it's like the sanitized thing with Purell all over the place in the daycare center. And everything is pasteurized, and when they get a cold, they go get a, a, a antibacterial, some kind of antibiotic. Flu shot every year. And, yeah, flu shot every year. And they're, they're loaded up with everything that you shouldn't be loaded up with. They're eating garbage and sugar, and they got candida. Let me tell you what, even good bugs in raw milk can make them sick. Because the biodiversity of the gut is just shot. So when I say safety, I mean, okay, when Organic Pastures Dairy puts a product on a shelf, one of 625 stores in California that carries it, you're one of a bunch of buyer's clubs, thank you. We don't get to choose that consumer. That consumer can say, I heard a great thing about raw milk and Belgian immune system. I just came out of chemotherapy and I got to build my immune Oh my God. They're picking me and I don't even know they're coming out of a wasteland of the immune system depression that's down at zero. I've got to have my game on in terms of making sure there's not a bad bug that takes advantage of that. Welcome that because their immune system is decimated. So it's kind of interesting to see what the, what the relative term safety is because on the farm it's like, oh, feed us anything, we'll be fine. And then the people that come to the farm, the people that eat raw milk a lot, eat well, they're going to be fine too most of the time. But you get the people that have decimated immune systems that are doing that Hail Mary to try to get back to a healthy immune system status after they got a wake-up call that Western medicine and Western food screwed them really bad then they could really be in trouble. So we have a really challenging problem right now where you have the farm environment, the organic biodiversity, sun-drenched, good bacteria environment, and then you've got this downtown place where most people live that embraces Western medicine, they're scared of bacteria, but then they hear raw milk is good and they can digest it and taste good, that's where the risk is. So it's very interesting to see the climate and environment we're in in terms of what we're doing. So we gotta have game on when it comes to what we're doing with that product in there. And it's, uh, I'm going to brag, unabashedly, it is a phenomenal, world-class product that it practically is. nobody can touch. Nobody can touch. And it hasn't always been that way. I've gone through an incredible Al Capitan learning curve like this, and it was all by ourselves. Nobody was helping us. In fact, people were saying, you can't do it, and we don't want you to do it. And it was all the negative saying, you won't, you won't, you won't. And I say, nope, I'm going to stand with my people. I'm not abandoning them. We're going to go to school. We're going to go to class. We're going to be the best we can possibly be, bringing all the technologies possible, get the right conditions, and do this better, 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 get knocked down, get back up with a smile, keep on going, keep on fighting. So that's what we're all about. And there are other farmers that are joining us, phenomenal farmers, back in Pennsylvania, Ed Shank, some other guys. They're doing things just like us, and we're working together to really build an emerging, very responsibly produced raw milk, and it's winning. It's winning, and the regulators are respecting us. They come and say, with well, that kind of bacteria count, don't even worry. they just like, hats off to you. Because they re they're surrendering. The fluid milk markets are not protesting because they can't do anything. The dollar voting is declining. So we're against the backdrop of failure, not success saying you can't do it. Yes? So can you kind of explain how you deal with Yep. So I know all about the production, right. whatever you call it, C-A-F-O, CAFO. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know that side of the story really yeah. well. But so what do you do? Kyle comes in, she's got well, mastitis, or she's got uh, some kind of infection. Are well, there's a range of things that a dairy cow could have. Yeah. Okay. An organic dairy cow um, has literally fewer things because of the demands put on her body. She's not having to put out 12 to 15 to 18 gallons of milk a day to survive and not become hamburger. Literally. What is like the yeah. average? Average? Cow, it, our cows are five and a half gallons a day, not 12 to 20 gallons a day. Yeah. Wow. They're milked twice a day, not three to four times a day. Wow. Uh, is that our, 
yeah, when, you, when you, Holstein, Jersey's, Jersey Holstein Crosses, Ayrshire's, Brown Swiss, we got every known breed of cows bred together. We're really into biodiversity and genetic diversity because it really makes a better, stronger cow. Right. The bottom line is, when you demand less of a cow and you put it in the right conditions with good feed and pastures and sun, you start seeing fewer diseases. The economic realities on a capo is, you've got to have yourself a race car that steps on the gas and just goes like crazy, burns out in 42 months and she's hamburger. 42 months. Two years, she's giving birth to a calf. A year and a half later, by average, there's exceptions, wow, obviously. That's horrible. But on average, 42, 46 months, that cow is off to be beef. And that's the females. That's you see what they do yeah, with the males. it does. So, uh, what we do is we use a lot of homeopathic and naturopathic and nutrition-based remedies. We use a lot of um, garlic. We have garlic tinctures we make. We use vitamin C shots, high dose vitamin C. Apple we cider vinegar. Stuff. We do culturing. We have an iPhone. Just like this one right here. Hi there, Steve Jobs. How you doing? Uh, <laughs> uh, iPhone, iPhone, iPhone fives, which actually has a app. It's called the uh, Mpingo app, app, app. It's a, um, a little two thousand dollar thing. It looks like a credit card reader. You put it on there. You take a milk sample and you squirt it in this little thing. It's a little card reader. You stick it inside, and forty five seconds later, it tells you whether what the cow the status is and the kind of mastitis, whether it's strep or statin. Wow. In no forty five seconds. Before it would be a five dollar test. And three days to wait. Right. Now we can go tip, tip, two dollars and fifty cents. We know exactly what's going on. Bingo, bingo. If she's got strep, she goes to our our herd um, health area where we actually give vitamin C. We uh, milk out more frequently. We uh, use a lot of garlic. Do a bunch of stuff, and she's fine in three days, almost ninety nine percent of the time. Have you experimented with the iodine in your cows? I know that that's been a real. Those are the, yes, all those kinds of things we're doing, and a lot of selenium, copper, all the trace minerals are very important. But the cow that has uh, staph aureus, she's gone. She's out of there because it's contagious and it can be a problem. We don't have very much of that, but that little device can tell us that immediately. So there's some technology that's meeting us early on now, well, where we are today. There's gonna to be some other technologies that tell us uh, E. coli 015787, probably in seven or eight months, we'll be able to do the same thing. Right now it takes two days to get that back. We'll have it in 45 seconds. So it's amazing where technology, the crossroads with food safety and preempting all these kinds of things are happening. And that's what's so exciting. So on, on a staph infection, you cannot cure her with anything? Cur had... Currently not. However, there's some interesting um, technologies maybe that we'll be able to 